The hybrid workforce is here to stay, and it requires real-time visibility, control, and rapid response of every endpoint, whether it's in the office or home. Tanium offers an endpoint management and security platform built for the most demanding IT environments. Many of the world's largest and most sophisticated organizations, including nearly half of the Fortune 100, rely on Tanium to deliver unmatched endpoint visibility and control. Whether you're preparing for zero trust or protecting your network from supply chain risk, Tanium empowers technology leaders to achieve greater agility, efficiency, and confidence. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash Tanium. Let's face it, cyber attackers have the advantage. ExtraHop is on a mission to help you take it back. Regain the upper hand with security that can't be undermined, outsmarted, or compromised. When you don't have to choose between protecting your business and moving it forward, that's security uncompromised. See how it works in the full product demo, free online at securityweekly.com forward slash ExtraHop. Welcome back to Enterprise Security Weekly. Cyber Risk Alliance, in partnership with InfraGuard, has launched the Critical Infrastructure Resilience Benchmark Study. Measure your readiness for ransomware by completing the survey and getting your score. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash CIRB to take the survey. SE Media debuts its all-new SC Digital Experience, fully integrated with Security Weekly podcast content and more. The new site increases the scope and scale of original content resources from editorial staff, contributors, and the far-reaching Cyber Risk Alliance network. Visit scmagazine.com to check out the new look. In the enterprise security news, <clears throat> we already mentioned uh, acquisition or two, right? Funding rounds. Um, intrigue. Did I get that right? Intrigue, definitely. Intrigue yeah. acquired by Mandiant. Jonathan Cran. Congrats, Jonathan, yeah. by the way, unofficially. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. Great product. It we, is. We yeah. tested it. We liked it. We kicked the tires on it. It's good stuff. Yep. Very good stuff. Hey, Paul. Yeah. You want to play some uh, new product Jeopardy? Yes. H how about Ooh. I read the press release description? Uh, but uh, but I'll leave the vendor name and product name blank, and you and Tyler can kind of kind of fill in the the blank there. All right, let's do it. Ooh, okay. All right, blank is the only managed cloud based next gen advanced threat detection and response service that ingests data across various layers of technologies to correlate normalize, enrich, and enable automated responses to malicious activity in real time. Wow, they hit all the... I mean, they win Ooh. buzzword bingo this week. The only wow. one that does all 19 of those things. Yeah. <laughs> it could be like a, a list of probably 50 or 100 vendors. Is it like an XDR play? Or no, no, zero no. It's got, it's got to have threat in the name or ZT in the name. Uh, Paul's closer. Paul's warmer with his guess. With XDR? Uh -oh. Yeah, yeah. Look through our stories. Is that, is that Palo Alto? I was trying not to cheat. Nope. Nope, Optive? it's not Palo Alto. Yep, got it. That Optive is Optive uh, MXDR. Yes. <clears throat> I. You know, what's interesting, though, is like I had to read this the quote uh, from a couple of times from David Martin, because at first I was like, what is he talking about? Then I'm like... Actually, if you think about it, like it, it really does make sense. So it's bringing simplicity, transparency, and automation. Uh, like even just those words are a lot to unpack. But when we think about what a SOC has to do, right? We don't want to overcomplicate things for the SOC. We don't want it. You'd have to spend too much time. So transparency, digging into finding the actual uh, issues, and we need automation to help bring all that together. I, so I'm not going to disagree with him on uh, on this stuff. It's just kind of interesting how they clombed it into one sentence, right? This was a, a PR uh, firm or person uh, really sure. uh, having a good day putting all this stuff together. <laughs> right? the, Optive said, uh, write it however you need to write it, but it has to have all these words on this list. Right. It yep, says, yep, uh, enhancing existing defenses to counter known and emerging threats with confidence and speed. I mean, that's what I want my socks to do. Quite, I mean, if you had to jam it into one sentence... I thought that was that was a pretty fair statement, right? Now, how they do that, in, in based on the other things in this press release, right, is where we'll we'll do some nitpicking of like how how are you doing that and how are you differentiating it from all the other solutions right. that claim to do basically the same thing. And, and what I want Tyler's uh, thoughts on is coming from Optive, aren't they competing with partners here by launching this? 
you know, it's an interesting. Resell? Yeah, it's an interesting question because I think a lot of the channel VAR vendors over the years, you know, they're used to flipping boxes, right? That's their lineage. They get, they they buy at a discount from Palo Alto or Cisco, whoever flips the boxes and sell them at a, at a markup, right? And that's always been their model. And I think about four or five years ago, they were struggling to really figure out how they flip that channel model into a, a SaaS and cloud native world. And I think what they've come to the realization is, is that that's essentially an MS, MSSP, right? Providing mm-hmm. value added on top of reselling services is an MSSP. So they're leaning into those plays. Um, and, you know, if 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 they're going to resell a SaaS product, there's no reason that you can't use them as a channel and resell that SaaS product, which leads it directly into a strong MSSP offering. So I get why they're going where they're going. Um, but, yeah, you'll, you'll definitely run into some channel conflict, but every company has to deal with that. Yeah, MSSP could be another topic discussion area it, that in, intrigues me at the moment. Is it worth asking Tyler what his, his favorite stuff he saw at Black Hat was? Yeah. Because you're the only one of the three of us <laughs> that went. Yeah, um, nothing. How's that, how's that for an answer? Um, that's, right, an answer on. that's an answer, though. <laughs> Yeah, it is totally an answer. Actually, you know, some of the some of the best stuff I saw was um, I, I had uh, coffee with Matt Alderman um, from CRA. That was one of the best things I saw of the trip. Um, <laughs> you know, just just getting to meet some cool people. Um, quite frankly, the show was underwhelming. I don't even think they hit their expected number of five thousand. They may have maybe hit three thousand. Um, mm. It was just a low turnout. You know, there were a handful of small parties that I avoided and. I wasn't too impressed. And I don't know if you guys heard, actually, um, Reinforce was just canceled yesterday as well. That conference is oh, gone. Oh, really? Yeah, they, they shelved that entire conference now. They've killed it off. Um, so I'm wondering how many conferences we're going to have throughout the mm-hmm. remainder of the year, you know, due to the Delta variant and the COVID uh, kicking back up again. Um, as far as I know, Gartner's still live. Forrester's still live. Um, Reinvent in December is still live. But, you know, at the rate things are canceling, it's tough to tell. Yeah. Ours are definitely still live. Yes. Yeah, InfoSec World and Security Weekly Unlocked. But uh but yeah, it's interesting. It's um I, I never got uh away to AWS's uh security conference, but I went to four reinvents in a row and I think it, like I understand why they did it, you know, because like a third of reinvent was a security conference. And I, I used to mm-hmm. kind of half jokingly tell people that my favorite security conference was AWS reinvent because it, security was just such a huge focus there. And, uh, you know, easily a, a third of the vendors on the expo floor were, were security focused. It just goes to show you the over investment that's happening in cybersecurity in general. Like, you get an idea in cyber, you can get money these days. It doesn't even have to have any kind of grounding in reality. Or, or fix anything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Many of them don't. <laughs> many of them just add to the pile of trouble that you have already from yeah. your other 20 different tools. Collection of broken toys. Still good stuff mm-hmm. happening out there. I, I did like Definitely. Qualys's announcement of supporting Red Hat Enterprise Linux Core OS and OpenShift. Uh, I thought that was a good enterprise play for them. I think we often don't talk about, you know, when we talk about containers, largely we talk about Docker and in the various cloud providers. Uh, we don't often talk about uh, Red Hat and OpenShift. Uh, I'm not sure what the market share kind of difference is, but the fact that Qualys is going to come out and support it means there's probably, my guess, a lot of big Qualys customers that uh, are using that and wanted the feature. My yeah, understanding it's definitely... is the op- Go ahead. My, my understanding is the OpenShift stuff is largely adopted by uh, large, large, large enterprises that want to have essentially, essentially an abstraction layer uh, that they can move containers and workloads between internal, hybrid, and and um, public public clouds, all different public clouds, and that's where OpenShift really gives them some leverage. You have to. If you've ever played with OpenShift, uh, it's an absolute beast um, to troubleshoot. You know, they, they, they've they really divided out all the different components, you know, and then CoreOS is, is also kind of designed for this, you know, the whole private cloud concept. Um, but, um, but yeah, to, to me, it would never make sense un- unless you had a pretty big team to, to manage it and, and babysit it. 
Yeah, it's you know, it's it's very IBM too, right? Mm-hmm. Here's yeah. this like massive enterprise, uh, you know, offering that is very specific and requires a lot of resources. You know, whether you're on their mainframe platform or other platforms are very similar. I mean, computing and technology wise, outstanding. And I think they're opting mm-hmm. for like lower adoption, uh, but large instances of that. It, it very much aligns with that. Uh, a lot of the mainframe ownership and, and mm-hmm. philosophy uh, that, that goes along with that. So, yeah, it, it totally makes sense as like a more modern um, version of the mainframe, you know, that IBM can can sell somebody on. Yeah, and I think, you know, sometimes you can lose sight of the Qualys bought a really awesome container security company called Layered Insight which we know a lot of the people that, that were there and some that are still maybe still there uh, as well. And that's what gives them this, uh, you know, the opportunity to, to play in some of these waters. Right. Uh, ThreadX's API catalog gives enterprise visibility into legitimate, suspicious, and malicious requests by the API. I was enamored with their... Uh, enhanced visibility into legitimate rogue and zombie APIs in production. Like the zombie <laughs> APIs, the ones you find and like you have to shoot them in the head before they die. Like I thought that was an interesting. They thing. infect you if they bite you. Something. What? What is a zombie? There, there, there's guess, an HTML head tag joke in there somewhere. Somewhere, right? Like legitimate APIs. Okay, the ones I'm using. Rogue APIs, the ones I'm using but I didn't know about before, right? Back to our asset management discussion. Zombie APIs are hanging out there, but no one's using them. Like, they're dead, yeah. essentially, yeah. They're, right? They're it's abandoned. Be. Yeah. They're abandoned, abandoned and yeah. not decommissioned. And those, for me, would present the most risk. I mean... Sure. I like yeah, the zombie, absolutely. you know, kind of uh, analogy there, but absolutely, those pose the most risk. Because if no one's watching the API, that could be bad. Like not doing rate limiting or any of the things that, you know, could prevent uh, someone from abusing the APIs. So does anybody know how this? Th- does anybody know how the ThreadX API catalog actually works? Yeah, is it that a was pro- my question. That, or does it scan <laughs> your endpoints? Right. Right. Because like, that, that's where's, what I was going to ask. Where's your API? I mean, if I, I think about, I have public APIs, right, that are used by my web application and maybe for other integrations. Then I've got all kinds of backend APIs. And those can be my applications that are running either in containers or Lambda services or cloud mm-hmm. native services that are all talking in APIs. That how do you gain visibility into all of those, right? Because that's that's always my concern. When we talk about APIs. It's one thing to go, yeah, like I got a server, it's accessible from the internet, it's got an API, and I got to protect it. But almost more concerning are those ones that are internal to my applications today. Yeah, no, it's yeah. it's it's a good question, right? Is is it using a reverse proxy model where all inbound APIs go through this kind of central gateway that then fans it out to wherever it needs to go? That's one way of doing it. Or it integrates with whatever internal API catalog systems you already have. You may have two, three, four of them. Amazon may have one, right? There's different ways that you manage those catalogs and they could be pulling those assets together into a single view. Yeah. Um, but either way, I think assets are under underrepresented in the AppSec landscape when I talk to a lot of different um, enterprises and customers in my in my daily travels, I, I rapidly find out that even the most mature AppSec programs generally don't have anything in depth for their APIs. Mm. They may they may hit it with a slightly smart DAS dynamic scanner and say, hey, that's good enough. But in general they're not they're not cataloging everything, looking for rogue or zombie like these guys are, yeah. are talking about. So I think it's a really interesting add on to a pretty you know, if you already have a relatively robust app side program. It'd be interesting if it integrates with uh, API Gateway from Amazon, which right. I, that's just, what I'm thinking. It, it must, yeah. right? It must be collecting all of API Gateway, MuleSoft, whatever gateways you're using to collect it all. It's right. got to integrate with all of them. And that's not going to cover all your APIs, but I think it's certainly, as you said, Tyler, some even mature organizations aren't doing that level of monitoring to go, yeah, I've got API Gateway. Now let's apply yeah. some security uh, monitoring and protection, perhaps, to what's flowing through my API Gateway. Yeah, it's a definitely a gap in pretty much every enterprise I talk to, even the ones that say that they do stuff right. Yep. Yeah, I think you're right. Looking at uh, some of their data sheets, that that sounds like how they're doing it, and, and they're not just doing API protection; they're they're doing um, uh, bot and and DDoS and WAF uh, protection as well. Oh, interesting. So they're actually yeah, they're actually injecting. They're probably doing both collection via catalogs as well as injecting via proxy. 
Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. Oh, just going back to Black Hat for a moment, uh, Acunetics had an interesting article uh, talking about some of the things they were observing uh, at Black Hat. And some of the best quotes came from uh, actually Grifter, uh, Neil Weiler. Mm. And uh, he, you know, kind of poses the question, like, who's responsible for security when everyone is responsible for security? You know, back to that accountability thing that we yeah. touched on in the previous segment. But it, it seems to be kind of, for me, one of the highlights uh, from this article because, you know, they, they talk about without a definitive answer for whose job is security, we're left to determine what the answer is for our own organizations. And I, I was given the, you know, example, when you put a security control in, who's responsible for maintaining that security control and not just the technical aspects of it, but the exceptions and then most mm -hmm. importantly, that communication back out to your organization, right? When you look at things like two-factor and patching, and which is some of the things I'm looking at right now, and how do I develop a policy? That's kind of the easier part, right? But how do I make someone responsible for that and give them control and management over like making exceptions, not making exceptions, and communicating the importance to the organization, which is often the most difficult part? Yeah, you don't want it uh, turning into a zombie security control. Well, that's what happens. It's, it's a great <laughs> analogy, right? You can say everyone should have two factor or whatever, but like who's monitoring that when it isn't the case for all of your well, domain I mean, users? How many change control and asset management systems have we seen where it's obvious somebody put a ton of effort into it and completely abandoned it mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. mo the moment they were like reached some project milestone? You know? Right. You know, I think really what it comes down to for accountability is whose head goes on the chopping block when something goes wrong. When you when you approach security accountability in that way, that person really quickly steps up and makes sure that shit gets done. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. So it, do you it, need a do you need a CISO? Is it the CISO? Not necessarily. They don't need the title. It could mm -hmm. be the CEO of the company. Right. And if you don't get it done, you're responsible for it. You've made the exception and you said, hey, I don't have the time to do this. I'm not going to actually execute this. Then that risk is on your head as the accountable right. party. And that particular example would be the, C or the CEO. Right. right. So they don't have to have a security title at all. Hell, it could be the, inf the guy that owns the cloud infrastructure. You're responsible for all security within cloud infrastructure. If we get breached because the S3 bucket's being wide open, you're the guy that gets fired. Well, guess what? I promise you your S3 buckets will be tight because that guy doesn't want that risk. So it always comes yeah. down to true ownership of something. If you don't have skin in the game, you're not going to go out of your way to make sure it's done right. Most people won't anyways. Yeah. It's interesting. Do you, do you deputize like people with the CISO title? Like in your model, Tyler, you know, you're the CTO and deputy CISO, right? Because you've got to have some ownership of the process too. Uh, it's, that's where BISOs come from also, right? Yeah. In, mm -hmm. in larger orgs at least. Mm-hmm. Harder for smaller organizations, right? They may not have those roles. Well, it really gets tough when you, as a CEO, say, hey, you know, one IT guy in my org, you're responsible for all of cybersecurity, and it's your head on the line when it goes sideways, and by the way, you get no resources. Yeah. That's, that's the bad scenario. Yep. Now you're accountable with no ability to fix anything. Yes. That's, you hit the nail on the head, Tyler. I, I, I like some separation of duties there, like having a... Uh, CISO as a service or something to kind of offset that that scenario, right? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think I always, I, I've recently started using this terminology of accountability and responsibility. Mm -hmm. You actually don't have to have both. You can be accountable and not responsible, or you can be responsible and not accountable. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, in some ways, hey, IT guy, we're going to make you accountable. Oh, you know, you don't have any resources. You have no ability to, to fix this. Well, then essentially there's no responsible party to actually execute, right? And so you need both facets to have a successful security design, right? You have to have somebody who's accountable for it, whose head's on the chopping block, but somebody who actually can be responsible and get stuff done. Yeah, agreed. And, and that can be a mixture of outsourced and internal resources Absolutely, as well. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. What else we got? There's a big acquisition. Um, or, or not acquisition, uh, merger, actually. Uh, Norton, LifeLock, and Avast are merging. Oh, interesting. Is it, though? Is it? 
Because <laughs> Nor- but Norton, Norton that came, is the question. Norton came out of Symantec, and Norton LifeLock yep. is just the identity protection piece. Uh, no, I, uh, I, I forget how they how they split it exactly. Uh, that that's that's a good question. Part of it went to Broadcom uh, mm-hmm. in 2019 when they when they split that up. Um, but no, I, I think they still have at least the consumer. I want to say Norton LifeLock was was the uh, consumer stuff. Was that also consumer AV? Yes, I think so. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, because I, I, I did some in the merger. I did some research on market share and uh, Norton LifeLock uh, as far as uh, uh, commercial AV coverage is, is still the biggest, uh, just slightly. Avast and and Norton LifeLock are pretty close together, but together they've got about twenty six percent market share. Mm-hmm. You know, and my source is not a huge. Uh, sample size that you know it's op swat puts out these monthly market share reports but um you know the thing there um op swat has a few huge blind spots one of those is any kind of next gen av company right you know so so you know any kind of uh, carbon black uh sentinel one crowd strike you know blackberry silence is, isn't going to be in there and also of course microsoft isn't mm-hmm. going to be in there. They're not going to have any visibility on on defender usage, which I think has been the real big AV kill in the last in, in the last uh, not quite ten years. You know, maybe five to eight years. Mm. Reversing Labs took on fifty six million dollars in funding. Yeah, they did. It's interesting. Reversing Labs has been around since two thousand nine. They got uh, an early investment from Incutel in two thousand eleven, but nothing after that until two thousand seventeen. So I assume, you know, they they were at least partially bootstrapped and uh, pretty self sufficient. Then it looks like either they they wanted to exit or uh, you know just grow more quickly. They took on a Series A in two thousand seventeen and. Uh, uh, which was a more modest one, and and now fifty six million is a decent size Series B brings them to a total of eighty one million. Um, that makes sense with their strategy, though, because I think early on, reversing mm-hmm. labs was kind of the back end for all their security companies' solutions. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then they made the pivot where they're like, no, we want enterprises to come to us directly as well, uh, and they've been yeah. on that pivot. So it makes sense they'd have to take on more funding for that. And they just scan billions of files at scale. For, for threats, you know, like yeah. that's their thing. You but know, they do they a do great that. job with intelligence, though. Like Mario yeah. is mm-hmm. in his team. They just do an amazing job of giving you awesome intelligence. It's not just like this IP is bad, right? I mean, they're giving you uh, unbelievable intelligence, actually, as to what could be running on your systems. Yeah, so if you're building a platform or something like that, you know, and you want to be able to, you know, you've got like a file upload feature or something like that, you want to be able to scan those, you know, they're, they're a pretty easy checkbox to say, hey, yeah. let's just you know, use reversing labs, plug them into our product so we don't have to build it. Good stuff. Um, what else talked about? Uh, uh, Morphosec announces new incident response services as enterprise attacks escalate. Uh, their new IR service assists organizations uh, containing in-progress incidents, reducing damage. So does this mean I need an MSP and MSSP and an incident response company as well? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, some even, of them do it, some of them don't. Mm. Even Sorry, more Tyler. services, you know, you're good, man. Even more services to outsource, right? Let's let's right. just outsource everything. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Like, what do I outsource? What do I keep in house? And how do I keep the balance? Right? Is it just an offset to my incident response, or are they, you know, how much responsibility they're taking over? Yeah, it's interesting. We we're, we're talking about. Um, and it's changing quite a bit because MDR is a lot more hands-on where, you know, traditional MSSP, it's more like, you know, we'll run it for you, you know, but you still, you know, if we find something, you know, we'll report it to you, but IR is on you, you know, and whoever you, you have on retainer. Right. Um, then you have to worry about, you know, if I'm going to try and get reimbursed for some of this uh, via my insurance policy, if I'm if I'm going to try and... Uh, um, submit some of this to my insurance provider, you know, they've got a list of folks I can use for IR and I've got to use somebody on that list or they're going to decline it. And, um, 
And it's interesting because now that we have FireEye and Mandy and uh, divorcing, breaking up here, you know, I remember in the early days talking to FireEye, you know, the thing was when they deployed their product out to their customers, you know, the whole thing that led them to acquire Mandy in the first place is customers would say, oh, okay, you know, your, your thing found something, you know, yeah, what do we now, do now? Mm -hmm. you know, help us, help, <laughs> help us fix it. And, mm -hmm. you know, they're kind of like, well, we can refer you to somebody, but you know, we, we, we don't do that for you. Right. It's not a thing that we do. And I think pretty much any company who makes a product that's going to find bad stuff is going to get that question at some point, you mm -hmm. know, Hey, do you, you know, yay, you know, we bought your product and it, it found something bad, you know, now we trust you, you know, we, we'd like you to come out and help us fix it. Mm -hmm. Uh, last story that I wanted to cover, um, risk scoring. <clears throat> I thought they did a good job, and this came from NetSpy, I think, uh, in you know listing out the various aspects that go into risk. One of the ones I didn't agree with so much was industry comparisons. I've never been really high on industry comparisons. Like, what's well, like, we're in finance. What's everyone else in finance doing? Mm -hmm. I just, as a risk, it could, part of a risk equation didn't make sense. I like how they outlined uh, impact, likelihood, environmental modifiers, temporal modifiers, right? Is it exploit code? How mature is it? That kind of thing. Uh, threat actors, uh, those types of things I think are important to a risk equation. Um, but industry comparisons, I'm not, I'm not big on that. Don't, don't worry about what other people are doing. You, <laughs> be, you be the best you. I actually, I, but I, I subscribe to that theory, though. I really do. My bigger question is, how do you quantify these things? How do you put numbers around, you know, industry comparisons and threat actors? Like, how do you actively say this is a 32% chance of this? And, uh, you know, that's always the gray area when you when you do these kinds of things. The answer is fancy math, Tyler. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that that is literally the, uh, you know, the, those machine learning mm -hmm. models, you know, I've, 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 uh, um, I've actually helped uh, with some of those. I, I've worked with the data scientists um, both like directly in a company I was working for when I was back at NOPSEC and, and indirectly, uh, you know, chatting with uh, the folks at uh, Kenna Security uh, over the last decade. And um, did you find the output reasonable? Did you find the output to be, hey, this makes sense and is within the ballpark of sanity? The, the the output is reasonable. The input is not. You yeah. Know, it, the, ah. the, there was there was a huge input output problem, and it's interesting because uh, for a long time, exploit DB was one of the the key uh, pieces of that. You know, because you're looking mm -hmm. to see if an exploit exists for a given vulnerability, and exploit DB was just a dumping ground. You know, like mm -hmm. like you know, um, you, you'd have just a, a bit of Python that would tell you if you're vulnerable. And because it existed on exploit DB, they would say, okay, an exploit exists. Um, you know, so there, there was no validation of whether it was actually an exploit or whether the exploit mm. worked reliably. Um, but that's been cleaned up. I went to exploit DB the other day and it looks like they went through a huge cleanup and now it looks much more accurate. Uh, for a long time, but I mean, you could fix that with with waiting, you know. So mo most folks wised up pretty quickly and and would start to put more weight on Metasploit over things like Exploit DB that are, you know, where there's little quality control uh, until recently, apparently. So I think um, probability is you know somewhat objective, right? The what you're talking about is probability of exploit with regards to. Hey, if something well, exists, right? Well, first uh, of all, does it exist? Does it work? You know, and then are we actually, right. you know, threat tell? Are we actually seeing it be uh, be used by malware that's out in the wild and, and causing? And that feels quantifiable. Damage. That feels reasonable, yeah. right? But then when you start to say, well, what's the impact? Risk impact, right? Because we all know risk equals probability times loss, right? Um, what's the loss? What's the potential loss? That's so arbitrary. And, and that has to, to come from inside. Yep. You, yeah. You've got to put, you know, the asset criticality score on, you know, like, like yeah. uh, that has to be, that's, that's the custom customization tax, you know, that, that falls on the customer to do that bit. Yeah. We're both analysts. We both know that we can make numbers be whatever we want them to be. It's just very yeah. true. Very true. Well, that's the news for this week. Next up, micro interviews from Black Hat 2021. Stay tuned. <laughs> 